We sing praises to His name because He inhabits the praises of His people. Amen? Amen. And when we praise His name, He reveals His presence. There's nothing like the manifested presence of the Lord. And uh, we just look so forward to God revealing Himself to us. Amen? You know, not just in church, but in every, your everyday time of prayer and praise. Expect the presence of God. Expect the atmosphere to change. Because He, uh, His presence does indeed change the atmosphere. Hallelujah. Well, this morning, I want to talk to you about victory. The victorious life. Also, within that subject, we're going to be talking about overcoming temptation. And next week, uh, I'm going to kind of tag on to that. We're going to talk about overcoming temptation this morning. But I'd like to add on to that or tag on to that next week how to deal with guilt and shame. And, you know, because sometimes we don't overcome temptation. And then we have the guilt and the shame of the sin that we may have committed. So how do we deal with that? What, how, what, what, what are we to do with that? So next week we'll be talking about that. This morning, as I bring up this subject, I bring it up when it's not popular to talk about sin. It's just not a popular subject nowadays. As a matter of fact, I shared this a long time ago, but I had a cousin... At a family reunion one time, I was inviting to the Lord, and I mean, inviting the church, well, and to the Lord, amen. But I was inviting her to church, and she said, I don't want to go to church, all they ever do is talk about sin. And I said, well, Come to our church, we don't talk about sin. And I did not mean it that way, but I looked up and there's a video right there, you know. And what I meant was, you know, we, we don't talk about it in a way to condemn you, we talk about it in a way that you can be free. From sin, Amen. And uh, so, uh, but we are talking about sin this morning, even though it's not popular. You know, some think we ought to ignore sin altogether. You know, just uh, it should not even be discussed. Others go as far as to say sin does not even exist unless it exists in your mind, unless you believe it. And, and these are uh, uh, churches and pastors, believers that once believed of the evangelical message of. You know, God came to save us and uh, uh, from sin. Amen? But, church, I will teach and preach on sin. Because it's in the Bible. Unless we understand sin and its implications, we'll never walk in victory over sin. You know, the whole reason to talk about sin is that we learn how to overcome it. Amen? That we learn how not to give in to it. So, first of all, I want to start off talking about victory over temptation. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, it reads there, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful. Listen to what it says here. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Now, first of all, keep in mind he's talking about temptation. Being tempted to do something that is wrong. That is the subject matter here. Amen? And it tells us that he will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we're able. In other words, the devil cannot make you sin. He does not have the power to force you to sin. Sin is always a choice that we make. Amen? Now, there are three areas, basically, that we are tempted in. And they're found in 1 John 2, verses 15 and 16. Let me read those to you. It reads there in 1 John 2, 15 and, and 16, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh... The lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. 
So let's just take a quick look at these three areas of temptation this morning. First of all, you have the lust of the flesh. Now, when we are born again, we're given a new nature. We're given the nature of Christ. Amen? It said He came to, and He took away our sin and gave us His righteousness. That old man died. That old man was crucified with Christ, was buried with Christ, and died with Christ. We've been raised in newness of life. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We now have a righteous nature. We have the nature of God within us. That old man, that old nature is dead. However, there's still this thing called renewing the mind. Amen? Anybody in here, I'll say smoke or ever smoked? You ever smoked cigarettes? Okay. How many of you know that even though you quit smoking, and you overcame, there's still a tendency to, to want to do something with your hands. You know, there, there was something, uh, uh, because you had such a habit of doing that for so many years, that after you eat, the first thing you do is when you want to reach for a cigarette, you know, or something of that nature. Now, it's the same way with our sin nature. You know, that sin nature uh, uh, has been buried, it's died, but we still have this way of life that we're used to living. And, and uh, we, there's what's called renewing the mind. We're transformed into this new nature. Even though it's been taken care of, the root of it has been taken care of. I know whenever I, I, I got saved, God delivered me from alcohol. I was a, a teenage alcoholic. And, and I mean, when he, he took it away. I mean, that, that, that drive uh, that I have to have it went away. Unless you've ever been in bondage, to something, to cigarettes or alcohol or something like that, you really can't comprehend it. The best way I can explain it is, you know, whenever you get really hungry and you want to eat, you just got to eat. Well, it's the same type of a, a chemical uh, uh, attraction in your body for alcohol or for cigarettes or whatever it might be, drugs. And, and you have that drive for it. Well, that drive went away. That have to have it went away. But I still had to renew my mind into a different way of acting, a different lifestyle. And it's the same way when you become a Christian. The old man's been crucified, buried, and dead, but we still have that old way of thinking. And we have to renew our minds to that, that old way of thinking. We do that by the Word of God. We're transformed by the renewing of our minds. So as we look at this, we realize the enemy is still there to tempt us. And that, and that natural part of us wants to give in to that temptation. That old unrenewed mind wants to give in to that temptation. You see, uh, especially in the day that we live in, uh, 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 sexual temptation is, is very prominent. I mean, it's just, we're bombarded on the television, billboards, magazines. Everywhere you look, there, there are, are suggestive uh, 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 thoughts or that they, they try to get you to have these thoughts and, and so you have to be on guard for these sexual uh, uh, pleasures if you will that are ungodly and, and those that are ungodly are those that are outside the marriage relationship amen but it's not only sexual but it's basically the desire for the forbidden things that are forbidden it might include drunkenness it might include <coughs> escaping responsibility a uh, matter of fact, there's a list in Galatians 5, beginning with verse 19 and through 21. It reads there, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outburst of wrath, selfish ambition, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, reveries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That gives you just a list because it goes on it, later, it says, and the like. In other words, that's just a partial list. But, at, but as we look at this, uh, we see it's just a lifestyle of pleasing the flesh, of pleasing the unrenewed mind. This is called hedonism. And, and, and that is a belief that, uh, that pleasure or happiness is the most important goal in life. Matter of fact, remember back, what was it in the 70s? If it feels good, do it. 
know, that was kind of the, the, the major thing. Well, if it feels good, do it. Please the flesh. Basically is what it's saying. And church, this has seeped into the church. This feel-good attitude, whatever pleases the flesh, and is prevalent today in the church. I believe God wants to bless us. Don't get me wrong. God wants to prosper us. God wants to bless us in so many ways. However, that should not be our ultimate goal. You know, sometimes we try to get people in the church by, oh, become a Christian. You'll be blessed and life will be wonderful. And all that's true because it does say the thief comes not but to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I come that you might have life and that more abundant. But church is not just about our pursuit of happiness. Whatever feels good, do it. See, the word lust suggests being out of control. When we seek the things of the world in such a way that we're out of control of the situation. In other words, we're consumed with it. In, in Matthew 6.33, it reads there, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. What things will be added to you? Well, today we would say to a home, a car, you know, money. All these things that the Gentiles seek. It says it will be added to you. But the point is, we're to put God first. And the church has really lost this truth of putting God first. In other words, I'll fit God in wherever I can fit Him in it. No, the Bible says seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto us. Pleasures, whatever. It'll be added unto us. God doesn't want calls to be monks. We, we can enjoy the things of life, but we need to put Him first. Get our priorities straight. Our goal should be to seek Him, not what He has. Our goal should be to seek His kingdom and His righteousness. What is God's kingdom? Well, it's, it's the rule and reign of Christ in your life. That's His kingdom. You see, whenever you allow Him to rule and reign in your life, you are His kingdom. Amen? We should seek His will for our lives and not be guided by our unrenewed minds. We need to be guided by what God wants for our lives. And if we'll listen to Him and follow His will, church, there's no better place to be. There's no safer place to be. There's no more blessed place to be or happy place to be. We're to put on the mind of Christ. And when we put on the mind of Christ, we let Him reign through us. You see, you cannot pray your kingdom come until you pray my kingdom go. You see, most people just want to build up their kingdom. That Many Christians could care less about His kingdom. It's about what I want. What makes me happy. My success. No, it's not to be about me. It's to be about Him. It's not to be about my kingdom. It's to be about His kingdom. Then it goes on and it talks about the lust of the eyes. And that is simply the desire to have what you see. You know, you can lust after uh, a vehicle. You can lust after uh, money. You can lust after any kind of possession. It's whatever your eye sees. Ooh, I want that. Be your neighbor's wife. I mean, you know, the Ten Commandments talk about that. You, you can lust after anything. Does that mean that it's wrong to be successful? See, that's where a lot of people get it wrong. It's like, well, I guess I can't have a desire to be successful financially or anything of that nature. No, that's not true. However, the problem comes when these things become our God. We need to understand that things are temporal, but the things of God are eternal. Amen? Advancing the kingdom is more important than, than getting that new thing. Or that newer thing. Again, it really has nothing to do with how much you have, but rather what's most important to you. you know, where, where do the things of God line up in our thinking? What's controlling you? Is it the things of God or is it the things of the world? I, I remember, you know, a lot of people think, if somebody has a lot of stuff or if they're wealthy, oh, then they're materialistic. You know, materialistic does not have anything at all to do with what you have. It's what you got in your heart. For instance, somebody who have nothing would be way more materialistically minded than somebody who has all kinds of wonderful things. 
You see, because all they can think about is, I want that, I need that. And that's where they're consumed with things, whether they have them or not. I remember a man that I knew uh, back home, I guess when I first became a Christian. And uh, I mean, he was rich. He was well over a millionaire. I mean, he, I mean, he had a really nice house. And he, you know, he owned like, condos. And he, he owned uh, property and businesses. I mean, very rich man. And my somebody might say, well, he's materialistic. Look at all the stuff he has. What they don't know is he probably gave 10 times my salary that I made then, maybe more than that, into the things of God. I think he gave 60% of what he earned away and just lived off 40% of it. You see, sometimes we get caught up, give 10% of my money to God, to God's kingdom, to God's work. I, I can't afford to give 10%. Yeah, that's just a starting point. Well, we're not under the law to tithe nowadays. We shouldn't be doing it because you're under the law anyway. You should be doing it because you love God and want to advance His kingdom and you believe more than the hereafter than you do in the here and now. That's just a starting point. Our goal should be maybe I can get 20%, maybe I can get 30%, maybe I can get 40%. I know not, most of us aren't in a position to do that, but who knows? Maybe we start edging it up a percent at a time may never notice it. But again, we go back to, it's not what you have, it's what you have in your heart. You see, there's some people that, that may only give a, a small amount, but man, their heart says, oh man, I would, I would love to give more if I had more. And But they mean it. If they had more, they'd give more to the work of God and His kingdom. The lust of the eyes. You know, many Christians would be disappointed when they get to heaven they're going to go, you know, I really should have put more thought into eternal things. Why did I put so much emphasis on the life that I lived? Why didn't I realize how true what I said I believed is? Amen? You know, the lust of the eyes is a partner to the lust of the flesh. It's looking on that which you should not be looking on. You've heard it said before that the eyes are the gate to the soul. Well, there, there is biblical uh, basis for that. In Matthew 6.22, it reads there, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. That's why we have to be careful what we look upon, amen? What we gaze upon. Your heart will be filled with what you gaze upon. If you struggle in the world we now live, uh, or actually, let me put it this way. You can't watch a hamburger commercial without them trying to get your eyes on something that shouldn't be on. I mean, it's just prevalent. They, you know, it's, it's true. Sex sells. What does some half-naked woman have anything to do with a, whatever a Hardee's burger is? <laughs> what in the world? You can't even look at a good Harley advertisement without messing it up with some naked girl on it. Come on. Why does one look at the pictures of the Harley? Amen. <laughs> I know I've said this before, but it's so funny. Is you know, in Job it talks about making a covenant with your eyes, you know, what you'll gaze upon. And uh, Cheryl might be out, and it'd be some woman walk in with no clothes on or something. Cheryl, look at that. And I'll look, why'd you tell me to look at that? <laughs> I'm trying not to look at that. The lust of the eyes. You know, uh, Steve Hill, some of you may remember him, evangelist. He's going to be with the Lord now. But he used to talk about the second second. You know, sometimes you can't help what you see. I mean, you're driving along, you look up, there's a billboard. And it's suggested. And you don't want your mind to go in that direction. And, and, and you see it, or a commercial comes on, and it, it's just there. And uh, But he talked about what you call the second second. 
Can't help that first second, but you have a choice about the second second. Amen. I mean, you can't help sometimes what you see, but whenever you turn around and take another look at it, that's a choice. And he said the second second. I remember I preached on that one time years ago when Tony was a teenager, and he says, Well, I just take a roll on first second. <laughs> but seriously, we need to make an eye with our covenant, our covenant with our eyes, amen. And uh, you know, don't put yourself, I always say don't put yourself in a position to be weak. You know, always dwell upon that which is going to strengthen you to overcome temptation. Don't put yourself in compromising positions. I remember even back when I was in Bible college. I mean, you wouldn't think you'd have to tell a group of ministers this, but they said, guys, you know, don't do count, don't do counseling in a motel parking lot. You know, I guess that's that's happened. But you always want to be careful and don't put yourself in a compromising position. I remember a story I heard years ago about Billy Graham. He made a covenant with several other guys that they would never be in the presence of a woman by themselves. And uh, one day uh, a lady called him and said, you know, Brother Graham, I really need to talk to you. It's very important. Would you please come and see me? And gave him her room number at a hotel. And he says, okay, ma'am, I'll, I'll, I'll be right over. And so he goes and knocks on the door. And she opens the door in this sexy uh, outfit, you know. And he says, hello, I'm Billy Graham. He said, this is my wife, Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, went in to talk to her. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it's you, you got to be careful not to put yourself in compromising positions. It's very, very important. And that goes with the ladies as well. Because, you know, you people think, well, I would never. But just don't test yourself, amen? You know, it says, uh, you know, take heed lest ye fall. Don't put yourself in a compromising position. Then next we have what they call the pride of life. Now, I feel like this is probably the worst uh, uh, temptation. Because many, many people are, are tempted. You know, it's pride that caused Satan to fall. You know, Satan said, uh, I'll be like God. In other words, I'm just as important as God is. I'll be like God. You know, the Bible tells us that God resists the proud. That's enough reason right there for me to want to resist being proud, amen? Because it says God resists the proud. I don't want God to res resist me. You know, I've heard people, evangelists, get up before, and, and I did this, and I did that, and I did this, and and, and uh, I nudged Cheryl and I said, uh, slap me if I ever talk that way. You know, because it's not about I, amen. It's about him. And we gotta, you know, we gotta be really careful. That doesn't mean that you can't talk about certain things you may have done because that could encourage people. But you better know your heart. Why are you saying? Are you trying to get glory or are you trying to give God glory? And that's the major difference right there. The pride of life. Everything should revolve around Him. You're into pride when you want it to revolve around you. The Bible tells us to consider others. To seem others higher than yourself. In other words, you know, we are called to follow Jesus. And Jesus called Himself a servant. And, and we're called to be servants. We're called to serve one another. We're not called to go around trying to get people to serve us. Amen. Jesus didn't do that. He went about serving others. We're to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, not the leading of what we want. Now, sometimes they're the same thing. Other times they're not. But we need to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. So these are three different ways that the enemy will come and tempt us. Sometimes, uh, uh, in some ways, they're interconnected. In other ways, they'll stand alone. The question is, how do we overcome temptation? How do we obtain the victory? First of all, we're told that God will not be let us be tempted beyond or in any manner that we're not able to resist. In other words, the enemy can't make us sin. That's the important thing. Sometimes temptation can be very, very strong. But you have to understand that you don't have to give in. Amen? Amen. Now sometimes you, you, you'll find yourself giving in. I'm just going to be honest with you. Uh, you know, sometimes you'll find yourself giving in to a temptation. Well, that's why you got to come back next week. Amen? So you find out what to do about the guilt and shame because you did that. But there's always a way of escape. I knew a guy that used to be a ladies' man. 
and uh, you know he was very loose. You know, if you can use that term for a guy. And he got saved. Well, one day he found himself in the company of a young lady. He was single, she was single, and you know they kind of put themselves in a position they shouldn't have been in. Really, should not have been alone uh, uh, in that manner. Well, anyway, things started going a little too far, and. He thought of that verse. He'll make a way to escape. So he just jumped up and took off running. <laughs> you see, there's always a way of escape. Amen? No matter how strong the temptation, there's always a way of escape. Now, we're told in the book of Romans that sin shall not have dominion over you. That's good news, isn't it? In other words, you don't have to give in every time temptation comes up. Jesus came that we might live a victorious life. Uh, he came that we might have a life of freedom from bondages and uh, 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 that sin brings to the table. Jesus came that we might have a victorious life. He came that we might have an abundant life. Satan tends to uh, steal that joy. He comes to steal that peace that we have. Uh, and and, and when he tempts us to sin, that sin will ultimately destroy our lives and ultimately even kill us. And so that's why we talk about sin because we do not want sin or Satan to have victory over our lives. We want victory over him. Amen? I, I, I said this verse earlier in John 10.10. 10, it says, The thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. You see, Jesus wants us to have that abundant life. In 1 Peter 5 eight, how do we how do we escape? How do we overcome temptation? We talked about this a few weeks ago. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's looking for a weak area in your life. He's looking for a place that he can cause you. How do we get victory over temptation? 1 Peter 5 9 tells us. Resist him. Steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. James 4 7. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You know, a lot of Christians have memorized that last part of that verse. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But they forget the first part. What does it say? Submit to God. Submit to God. Resist the devil. See, we need to submit our lives to God. We need to put God first in our lives. And we'll move on to the second mic here because I'm breaking up a little bit. I'm almost halfway through, but I thought I'd change mics anyway. He goes on to say, again, therefore submit to God and resist the devil and he'll flee from you. We're, we were told, we just looked for several weeks, we're to put on the whole armor of God. You see, we need to prepare ourselves for the attack of the enemy. If we walk out unprepared, there's a good chance we'll submit to the enemy. There's a good chance we will not resist. There's a good chance we will give in to temptation and we will have uh, the guilt and the shame to deal with because we gave in. But again, if you come back next week, i got some good news for you. Amen? Realize we're walking according to the Word of God. According to Isaiah 55 or 54, 17, it says, No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And, and in 2 Corinthians, I'll close with this verse, 2 Corinthians 2, 14, it says, and God always causes us to triumph. Amen? So church, I want to encourage you with these words. Become victory-minded. Do not have a defeated attitude. You know, a lot of folks say, well, you know, we're just sinners saved by grace. Well, you know what a sinner does? A sinner sins. That's their lifestyle. And all those Christians, there may be those times, and there will be those times, that we won't overcome temptation. But that's not our lifestyle, amen. 
Our lifestyle is to walk in victory. Our lifestyle is to realize that greater is He that is in us than He that is in the world. Our lifestyle is we're more than overcomers, amen, in Christ Jesus. And we need to begin to think with the mind of Christ and realize that Romans chapter 6 tells us, sin shall not have dominion over you. Amen? Hallelujah. Amen. Because sin's ugly. And I've shared this several times. I can't remember who originally said it. But it says this about sin. Sin will cost you more than you want to pay. Take you further than you want to go. And make you stay longer than you want to stay. And that is so true. Any kind of sin. Because even what we might call little sin will mount up to bring bondage into our lives. And we're not talking about this as just simply rules and regulations. We're talking about lifestyles. Amen. We're talking about how to obtain victory in life. And one of the ways to obtain victory in life is to learn how to overcome the enemy when he comes with temptation. Amen. And, and uh, uh, Jesus, in Luke 4, I believe it is, and when he was led into the wilderness, the enemy came and tempted him time after time. And what did he say? It is written. The word of God, which is what? Our sword. Our shield of faith. Our, our sword. The word of God is our sword. We take up the shield of faith. We take up the sword, which is the word of God. And we come against him with the armor of God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for uh, the light that it brings. Lord, I just pray that somehow you'll take uh, the words that were spoken this morning to help bring victory to your children. Lord, that uh, the enemy's not as big as he wants us to think that he is. He's not as powerful as he tries to make us believe. But Lord, we know that you who are in us is greater than him. And Lord, we just give you the praise for victory right now. And Lord, I just pray for each person that's here this morning. Father, for those that were not able to make it today, I pray, Lord, that uh, your word would just come alive in each and every one of us. That it would rise up. And, Lord, that it would just bring victory in, in everyday situations. And, Lord, I just pray that your, your people would sense that victory by your Holy Spirit. And we're careful to give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 God bless you. And uh, 